Richard Dempsey, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to hear your thoughts and to hear how Corona has affected you and, um, and what your plans for the future are. I've had some fabulous conversations already with some people, so um, I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, so first of all, can I call you Dickie? Of course you can, yes. <laughs> you and I have known each other for about 27 years. Yes. We went to drama school together and met. We met at the audition. Didn't we? we got in on the same day together, didn't we? Yes. And I remember being completely starstruck when I saw you, <laughs> uh, which we'll go into in a minute. But first of all, um, just for the benefit of everyone listening, our listener, um, tell us about who you are and what you do, where you live and how you got to where you are. Um, well, I'm an... Actor. I suppose I'm what you'd call a jobbing actor. Uh, I had a sort of an unusual start as a child. Um, I started off in an amateur theatre in my local town, um, or the local amateur theatre in my, my town, Welland Garden City, which is a place called the Barn Theatre, which is this brilliant amateur theatre that has produced lots of really interesting um, writers and directors and um, actors. And, and I was very lucky to, to have that as my sort of outlet, you know. Um, and then when I was 14, just by some bizarre piece of luck, I, I, I landed uh, a part in The Line of the Witch of the Wardrobe for the BBC. And that was um, the first thing I did. So I was suddenly exposed to over like 12 million viewers a week. You know, this is before we had, you know, cable and uh, we only had four channels at the time, maybe five. And um, it was this incredible, incredible experience um, and yet at the time I was very protected because it was before social media I just went back to school um, and I carried on as I was you know I had a Saturday job in John Lewis um, and uh, and occasionally I'd see myself on the telly because I worked in the radio and television department and um, it was it was it was amazing but also I, I do feel very blessed that it was it was then and not now uh, and so it allowed me to go to drama school and um, meet people like yourself and drama school was this incredible experience you and I were two of the youngest weren't we so it was it was probably a different experience for us than people that might have been to university or, or maybe in my case probably were more well read than, than I um, as it was a very very classical course um, but I loved it and I loved our contemporaries and uh, and have gone on to be, become a, a, you know an actor probably more for stage than, than TV, although the first 10 years of my career was doing television. Yes, so, um, and actually I was thinking what was interesting for us then at drama school is we were probably the youngest. Um, I think Rhiannon was actually a year younger than us, but she seemed to be an old soul somehow. Yes, and she was very academic, wasn't she? She was, she was. Yes. Uh, and so we were learning with people who were quite a bit older than us, some of them. Yeah, people in their 30s, you know, and we were in our teens at the time. Um, and people that had been to university already and uh, from other countries, which was actually an incredible thing because, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I felt like I, I, I learned probably more from our fellow students than I did actually do, did from the course. Yeah, I think it was a bit of... F f for a few of us, it was a bit mind blowing the whole experience because it was so intense. It's not like university at all, is it? It's quite different. No, it's it's every hour of the day, and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hear stories of you know people having rock and roll experiences at, at university or at, at school, but I mean, we really didn't have time, did we? We were just constantly <laughs> learning something or yes. rehearsing something, and um, sometimes you would be teching until midnight, you know. Yeah. We? Yeah. Um, something that struck me talking about this is, what about those students who have just come out of drama school, just graduated now, how must they be feeling? Well, I mean, it's, I really feel for them. I really feel for them. Because I mean, it's difficult enough at the best of times, you know, and even when we were at college, you know, you, 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 know, you, you do all that work and you have all that hope. And then, you know, a lot of people leave and, and don't have work, certainly not straight away. And, there's always two or three people that, that, that are, you know, are extraordinarily lovely and, and do have work straight away. But most people don't. But to come out of college now and just certainly know there won't be anything for a good 
six months, certainly theatre-wise. I mean, I do think there's there's one girl I worked with last year who's just graduated. She was she was working backstage on something, but she was studying at Bristol. She graduated in September, and I was saw an Instagram yesterday. She's doing a film in Czech Republic, which is great. So there's there is definitely stuff happening, but it is definitely harder anyway. Um, I do think there's probably once everything settles down again, there'll be more film and television opportunities because um, because of Netflix, Netflix, you know, yeah. and all the streaming services expanding and, yeah. and opening studios in this country. Absolutely, but because of COVID, there is a lot of stuff online on telly, so a lot of actors are having to um, sort of change their their style because, of course. Theatre acting and TV acting are two very different things, aren't they? They are, and I think theatre acting, um, the style has changed, certainly from when we were, we were training. Um, just to give you an, an example, you know, we were taught by, at the time, what were considered quite sort of radical voice teachers who were almost going against what had, had been the traditional style of teaching um, and speaking Shakespeare. Um, and now I sort of think anything goes. And when I left college, I, I didn't really get on with Shakespeare at college at all. And I didn't really get on with the teacher. Um, we shall remain nameless. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as soon as I left, uh, I, I worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company and I worked with uh, people like Cicely Berry who taught uh, some of our teachers. And it opened up uh, my mind to there being different ways of speaking Shakespeare or, or just speaking. Yeah. Um, when we talk about an actor being successful, we don't necessarily mean that they're famous, do we? What do we, what do we mean? No, and do you know what? Because uh, we had a brief chat yesterday, didn't we? And I've been thinking about that a lot because you, you said to me yesterday, you're successful. And I thought, well, I don't know what success is because I look at you and I think, you know, you've done extraordinary things. You've run theatre companies, you've run you know, art centres, and you have a family. To me, that's more successful than anything. You know, bringing up a family. I mean, I've been lucky enough to, on the whole, <laughs> earn a living and, and keep going. But I think that is, that's a choice. Anyone can do that. And um, what I was really lucky with, lucky with was, was a strong start and the people around me, you know, including yourself. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the foundations of, uh, you know, a, community and family I think that are more important than anything and I think to come full circle to, to Covid that is what this time has taught us that is more important than anything even if it means communicating digitally and being creative finding different ways to be creative it's the community that is the soul of it all. Yes and um, I do want to go I do want to move on and talk about how Covid has affected you but um, I also want to ask we we We've talked a little bit about how you were a child star. I mean, I'm going to say that, child star. <laughs> um, and I think really interesting what you said about how different it would be now, or it must be now, because, you know, people who are famous, effectively, don't have such an easy time. As you say, you didn't have that social media. So you didn't, you didn't hear people being horrible to you on Insta or Twitter, or you didn't get bullied or, you know, in that way, you were effectively fairly oblivious to all of that, which I was meant, yeah. which I meant was you could actually get on with your normal life as well. Yeah, there was only one example of it, which was points of view. Do you remember BBC points of view? Yes. Uh, and I've only remembered this recently, but after the first episode of Narnia aired, there, was, there were letters, people's responses, and they read them out live on the BBC. And my letter was, why can't the BBC get a real child to play the part of Peter instead of the overgrown, pompous, yuppie dwarf? <gasps> now, can, that's the bit. <laughs> There's no way that would be read out live on air. I mean, it's, it's offensive <laughs> to every demographic. And, and I was a child, I was 14. <laughs> um, so, but, but, <laughs> I mean, I did get letters in my defence the next week, which probably, you know, healed the wound a little bit. But um, I was very, I was very upset by it. Can you see that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I remember that day. That was very early on. That was almost, I think, the first week of a six-month shoot. Because you pretty much grew up on that show, so that's okay. So that's really good. That's very early on. Yeah. 
if I close that down then, I'm sure I'm not doing this properly, but at least we can still see it. I yeah. love this. Yeah, I, I was just speaking to Mrs. Beaver this morning. Ah, uh, <laughs> well, well, Leslie, Mrs. Beaver is, is Miss, Mrs. Patmore in Downton Abbey now. Um, and so yeah. she, uh, she's, she's always remained a very good friend. And Sophie, who played Lucy, is, is, is a dear friend and I'm godfather to her, um, her little one. Oh, yeah. What's Sherlock that? Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. <gasps> Has to be playing a, a vampire with uh, Jeremy Brett. How fantastic. And that was when we were at drama school. That was during, yeah. no, that was just before I went to drama school, but that was aired when we were at drama school. So you have been a successful, because to me, successful means you've been working. I think that's Yeah, fun. I've worked. But you know, but yeah. there's, there's the, you know, everybody in this profession, no matter what level you're at, um, has sort of, you know, time out. And, uh, and actually I did have some time out before the lockdown. Um, so I think actors generally are pretty well equipped for a time like this. Um, it's definitely easy if you don't have a family. I mean, I, I, I think if I did have a family, it would be more of a concern. Um, but we're certainly used to um, uncertainty and um, making good of, of, of time out and, and being creative and finding other ways to earn livings. So how have you adapted then over the years, but particularly now when there is no work? Well, actually, it was always something that I was th I was thinking about until you know very recently. Anyway, before before lockdown, I'd never really established something else that I could do when I wasn't working. I'd done the odd you know bar job when I was younger, and um, but I'd never really developed sort of teaching skills or had the confidence to do it. So I, about a year ago, I started to look in, into that. And I uh, did a course in teaching English as a foreign language with a view to maybe going abroad and uh, maybe teaching in Asia. I'd, I've worked a lot in Asia with um, a couple of theatre companies and I just love it and I fell in love with all of it. Um, and uh, so I thought it'd be nice to spend some more time out there. But also, you know, the idea came out of necessity because I wasn't working and I thought, well, what's, what's a good way to earn money and, and be creative and do something that I love. So, you know, I, I would like to at some point teach English and incorporate that with drama in some way. Okay. Um, um, so lockdown happened and you said before lockdown anyway, you, you weren't doing a lot of work. What, what was the reason for that, do you think? Oh, I just, I just wasn't getting the job, which is the reality. I mean, I've had a year. I finished uh, Don Quixote um, for the RSC. Uh, and uh, I played Don Quixote, which was the most surreal experience because I, I was I was playing the Duke, who was this sort of like you know, ostentatious, pompous, <laughs> yuppie dwarf, <laughs> uh, sort of this you know Duke who's very cruel to Don Quixote. But part of my job was to understudy the role of Don Quixote that was played by David Threlfall, who's you know knocking on seventy. So I spent the whole time thinking, well, I'm not going to have to do this. And David was like. I never get sick, you know, he's hardcore RSC, you know, Tony Award winner, who's in Shameless, and you know, he's a proper hardcore actor and brilliant. And also I thought, well, like, well, if he's not on, nobody's gonna wanna watch the show. Anyway, guess what, David gets sick. So I had to do it quite a lot towards the end of the run. And it was terrifying. And then it became just, once it was in my body, actually quite enjoyable, and I and I loved it by the end, and and I loved the uh, the support I got from people like the front of house staff were just incredible. I used to get messages on Twitter. This is the nice thing about Twitter from people working front of house telling me, you know, how the show had gone, and you know, and just you know, giving me encouragement. So yes, yeah, so that finished uh, last year, and then I had a year of going up for lots of West End musicals, which is great. And it's one of my passions, as you know. Um, but I, I, I had this year of going through, getting through to the, they call it the finals, which is basically, you have to learn pretty much the whole show and perform it to a panel of, you know, producers and Americans and stuff like that. Um, but I had about four or five projects where that had happened, you know. So basically the, the whole of that year was working on shows, going through sort of recall um, and recall and doing finals and just not getting the job. Um, and that's, that's what happens sometimes, but you don't earn money when you're going through that process. 
But that is, as you know, that's the reality of our profession, you know. And, uh, and so when lockdown came along, I was a bit like, well, nothing's really changed for me. I've just had a really quiet year already. It was just more the financial uh, challenges and finding ways to, you know, yeah. be creative in that way. And you live in London. We didn't establish that. You live in London um, near Catford? Yeah, I'm right on the border of Catford and Forest Hill. So you can just zip into town uh, whenever you like, on a bus or on a tube. So yeah, or a bike, actually. What's it, this... what, what's it been like in London then since COVID? It's, uh, during the first lockdown, it was really eerie. Um, you know, I would drive through town dropping off shopping for a friend of mine that lives in London. And it would just be, you just wouldn't see anyone. It was like a zombie film. It was very strange seeing all the theatres shut and just seeing no one. Because London is never completely quiet, even on a Sunday. There's tourists and there's lots of things open. So that was very strange. And um, by about July, I think, um, things started to open up a little bit. And I did a workshop of a musical based around the Duran Duran songs old and new and uh, it was the first time I think there'd been a workshop or anything sort of professional that had opened up and uh, that was very interesting and it was very well put together and uh, we had to have our temperature taken every day, we had to have our, put our feet in a chemical solution when we came in, we weren't allowed to leave at lunchtime, um, although we ended up you know, relaxing that little bit um, and it was very encouraging about what you know what could happen and, and and now things are starting to happen in a much more controlled way shows are opening with social distancing um i don't think producers are making any profit from them but uh i i, I do i know it's bleak and it's it, and it's harder for, for smaller companies but i do think there is light at the end of the tunnel i think we're, we're as soon as we know that, that the vaccines are coming i think it will change people's psychological sort of outlook I do hope you're right. I feel, I feel quite different actually up here in Shropshire. Um, I think maybe for Lon maybe you're right. Maybe London does feel like that. And I think yes, for the for the for the companies who have the financial support and um, money in the bag, who can take those risks and who you know. I suppose who will know they will get the audiences because you always will in London. Nice. The fear here is all those small theatres that you know we as Hot Buckle visit. They are still closed. They 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 don't have the capacity to even downscale. You know they just cannot afford because they only have you know two hundred seater theatres anyway, or even if you know some of them fifty. 50 so a socially distanced 50 seats it would be what five ten people exactly and you know it just doesn't work and also i think maybe there's there's still a lot of fear but i mean you know i mean have you been have you been going on the tube are there you know what's it i i, I mean I'm, I'm i'm very careful and, I, and i'm one of those people that probably will get frustrated with because i i do take it all very seriously and i'm anti i mean i am a bit like that anyway um and uh, there's been a couple of occasions where I, I've had to get the tube, but only very recently. And I wasn't comfortable at all. Um, people were social distancing. They, and it, there's been a big change. I don't know about where you are, but certainly in London, as soon as they made um, it mandatory to wear face masks, there's been a big difference because I would say 95% of people are wearing them now on public transport. Whereas what, before, there, is st there are still people who aren't. Oh yeah, but oh, before there was it was fifty fifty, definitely, and so and it was and I was really uncomfortable with that. And I, you know, often you would say, I did one day, you know, try to be as polite as possible and say to this lady, Look, I'm not telling you to do anything, but can I just ask you why you're not wearing a face mask? And she's like, Oh, sorry, I've got one. It's like, well, how? Um, oh, people taking them off to make phone calls or to eat, you know. Um, yeah. But I didn't know. I mostly had only got overground trains. Uh, or buses, but I, I, to be honest with you, I avoid it as much as possible. I've got a bike and I cycle as much as I can. So do you think, um, therefore, that when you think of, say, this time next year, do you think we'll be back to normal? I don't think we'll be back to normal, but I do think things will feel a lot better. Um, I think 
you know, I think people will still be social distancing and I don't think everyone will be taking the vaccines or will have got the vaccine by then. Um, I think uh, certainly bigger theatre companies and producers might be able to pay for vaccines for their companies. Um, I think psychologically people will feel more relaxed about going out um, and I think that's what will change. But you know, who knows? I mean, I said I, I, I spent a lot of time in Asia. Now Asia has you know, been doing all of these things naturally anyway and that's why their infection rates are so low because they've had SARS and they have a different etiquette which is basically politeness. You know, they, they, they wear masks if they have a little you know, tickle of a cough because it's, you wouldn't want to pass that on to a colleague and that is part of the culture. And I hope that's what comes out of it. You know, there's, there's no problem with a, an audience, a packed auditorium and um, with people wearing face masks. There's, you know, I, I think those sort of things will stay. Um, but, you know, it depends on the individual. You know, if you're a nervous person um, or a fearful person, you know, it might take you a few years to sort of, you know, settle down and feel more relaxed being in, you know, an auditorium or on a tube. Um, Dickie, have you had any government support financially? Yes, I have. Um, I, I did the self-employed scheme um, was only a little bit, but it was it was enough to sort of keep me going. I worked in Toronto doing Strictly Ballroom um, about three years ago, and so you had to pay tax in Toronto. And so the, the self-employed scheme is based on three years of tax. Uh, so, but it was the, the, the tax that the, the, the grant that I got was enough to keep me going. Yeah, okay. and I think I'm really, really glad that he did it. Um, I think the fact they've reduced it is absurd to so 20%, although that's been put up, up to 40% now, I think. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if, if you, have, if you, I mean, with, for me, 40% is fine. You know, I, I can get by. But if I had a family, it would be really hard. Or if both of myself and my partner and my family, you know, if, if we're all creatives, I think obviously it'd be, it would be, you know, a real struggle. And I do know families like that. Yeah. People that are do really well, re you know, in, and, and, and have done really well over the last few years who haven't had any um, support from the government and musicians, especially musicians have had it particularly bad because they're just on that cusp. If they work a lot, they're just on that cusp of the, um, the tax uh, limit um, that uh, is taken into account with, with, with the grant scheme and they're not getting any help at all. And so they have no income and they're not getting any grants. So it has been... That's it's been really scary for a, a lot of us. A lot of musicians are, are giving up the business. Wow. Actually, that's a question that I was going to ask you. I mean, we've kind of covered that, you you know, your passion for teaching and, and that's great. I think it's very interesting, having spoken to a lot of people, that we as artists automatically find ways out of things and kind of um, yeah. find different things to do and creative things. We can't just sit around doing nothing. Um, which is why I'm doing this, you know. Um, and it's great that you're doing this. I mean, yeah, well, I, you know, I think it's been wonderful for me. I don't know if anybody else's interest, but I'm loving it. I can't but, wait to see the others. So. <laughs> but if there, if, you know, it, there was another massive wave and it got bad again and there really was no work at all, would you survive? What would you do? Oh, I mean, I have to do what I'm doing now, which is looking for other work. I mean, I, I'm, I'm applying for jobs to do sort of cover supervising work, which is basically supply teaching. Um, and uh, I've, I've, I do a bit of tutoring anyway, um, online and with you know neighbours' kids that are applying for their Lambda exams. Um, uh, I've just applied to do Amazon Flex, which is, is delivery with your own car, but it's, it's very flexible. Sure. But you wouldn't want to do that for the rest of your life, would you? No, I wouldn't. I mean, no, it, I, I don't have a problem doing it, but um, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, you, know, you get to a certain stage in your life when you question everything anyway. And there was a, you know, a time a few years ago where I thought, do I want to carry on being an actor? Should I do something else? So um, I was exploring the teaching possibilities. So my ideal would be is to... Um, teach English um, and, and be an actor, you know. And, I think and, that and, sounds glorious. I think I would love that as well. Hmm. Um, what makes you saddest about this situation? The older generation, um, definitely. Uh, my mum's pretty good because she's you know, quite well connected with my, my, my brothers. 
Um, but she's in her early 80s, you know, but she's, she's dealing with it brilliantly and has been really, you know, followed all the rules and you know, she, she's you know, lucky enough to have a garden. So, and when it was sunny, was able to spend, spend time outside. She was doing Joe Wicks every day, you know, the Joe Wicks. <laughs> then she hurt her shoulder and stopped. Um, another friend of mine, who's a very successful actress and uh, she's in her 80s and uh, she said something to me recently that made me very sad and she just said it's just very frustrating because there isn't much time left and this is such a waste of time and that that I think you know. that I really I, I absolutely agree and I think my mum feels that she's 80 mm -hmm. as well and, and I feel it you know I'm at a point now where I've got a lot of energy still I've got a lot of experience and I want to plough that into something. And I do feel, you know, very frustrated that time is just ticking and I'm just sitting here waiting. Um, and I'm not even sure what I'm waiting for or what there is to be waiting for. And it's, it's, it's really difficult, I think. Um, what, how do you think the government has fared? I think it's difficult. I think it's difficult for all the governments. I think, I mean, I personally been very frustrated with the government. I think they could have acted sooner. I mean, I, I flew back from Thailand in January um, and there were cases obviously in China at that stage. And I bought my mask straight away thinking like, well, you know, we're going to be told to everyone wear face masks here. And it was not till the end of March mm. that they did anything. And at that stage, they still weren't telling people to wear face masks. They were telling people not to wear face masks. Yeah. So that really made me frustrated. Um, I think the, I did think at the beginning of the lockdown that uh, the Chancellor um, was, it was good the way that he was supporting um, everybody, but clearly there was a lot of opposition to that and, and he changed his mind and now you don't quite know what his plans are for supporting people and it's all very confusing. Yeah. I think the, the, the idea that they said the artists or actors or actresses or anything to, sort of arts related jobs are not considered viable, I think is completely offensive <laughs> and not true. And so such a ridiculous thing to say at a time where, you know, people need to be in, in, encouraged because the truth is, you know, people are going home and watching theatre online, they're watching Netflix and lots of, you know, stuff that's been either sort of made recently that hasn't been shown yet or, or um, you know, yeah. repeats of stuff, but it's all, it's all art. So, Dickie, you've just had to move, move because you needed to plug your, <laughs> which is fine. Um, this is the beauty of the Zoom system. Um, so, finally, yes, I just wanted to ask you what you would like your legacy to be. Um, well, I think it was Maya Angelou that said this, um, but I think she said, when you die, it's not about what you've done or what you said it's about how you've made people feel so i would like my legacy to be <sighs> to have affected people in some way that have made them feel good you know through hopefully through performing or through art in some way and and, and maybe through teaching thank you mm -hmm. so much for giving up your saturday morning pleasure